so today is a, a webinar of case based discussion and this is presented uh, from uh, chl hospital icu uh, and it is moderated and made possible by dr niklesh jain sir is a director of critical care and operations at chl hospital indore which is the largest hospital in madhya pradesh and uh, it will be presented by dr khushbu agarwal she is junior consultant in intensive care there and joining us along with them will be dr vishal dr vishal is also junior consultant in intensive care and we'll have dr akshar shah also who is a, a dnb trainee in critical care in the same icu so everybody is in the same from the same icu and uh, we shall be discussing this case which is a case of poisoning so over to you dr khushbu okay thank you dr tampesh sir uh, so this is a case of unknown poisoning we'll be starting with the case vignesh so the case history goes like this a 32 years old female brought to emergency department by relatives after being found unconscious with saliva drooling out of from her left angle of mouth her relatives gave history of argument with her husband today morning with an allied history of ingestion of a bottle of some medicine details of which was not available at the time of admission on examination at baseline her GCS was four by fifteen. Her pupils were equal, constricted, and were sluggishly reacting to light. Her BP was seventeen eight mm of FG systolic. Her extremities were cold, with a heart rate of sixty two beats per minute and a respiratory rate of thirty two breaths per minute. Her breathing was shallow. There were bi bilateral V's present with the intervening intermittent fasciculation of the muscles. Her clothes were soiled. With vomitus, which had very strong pungent garlic odor, her RBS was one thirty two gram per percent. Okay, so uh, Doctor uh, Vishal, uh, yes. what is the differential diagnosis for constricted pupils? So <clears throat> uh, there will be a uh, if we see in the CNS, there will be a uh, pontine infarct or a pontine bleed. Okay, very good. What else? An organ of phosphorus poisoning. Okay. Uh, some other poisonings like uh, many yes, other poisonings. Codeine poisoning, morphine poisoning. Uh, okay. in case of heroin poisoning, opioid, basically, basically opioid. opioid, basically opioid. Any other poisonings? So, opioid poisoning, organophosphate poisoning, other poisonings? Any you know? Methadone poisoning. Methadone is part of opioid only. What okay. else? The various antipsychotics poisonings. Yes. Very good. And antipsychotics and also uh, benzodiazepine. benzodiazepine poisoning, yeah. sir. Mushroom poisoning. Benzodiazepine poisoning and mushroom. Very good. Okay, and sometimes even chloridine poisoning. Okay. Chloridine poisoning. So this this is very important because this gives a clue to the diagnosis. Constricted pupils. So pontine hemorrhage is obvious, right? You when the patient has hemorrhage, one can make out. And poisoning, this is the differential diagnosis. So now we are having hypotension with bradycardia. Almost there is a bradycardia. Normally there is hypotension, we get tachy tachycardia. So what is the differential diagnosis for hypotension with bradycardia? There aren't too many conditions. So, Doctor uh, Akshat, what are the depression diagnosis for bradycardia and hypotension? So, bradycardia and hypotension uh, gives a uh, signal of uh, cardiac arrest or, uh, uh, for example, uh, other uh, causes include sir poisoning, uh, OP poisoning uh, presents with uh, bradycardia and hypotension, sir. What other possibility of neuro? Neurogenic shock or spinal shock that may also present, but the history is not relevant here. Okay, great. What else? What other poisonings? Beta blocker poisoning may cause. Yes. And calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel. And what cardiac conditions can cause? RV infarcts. Very good. Not not the RV as such. Inferior wall. Inferior wall. Inferior wall would be. Inferior wall would be. Inferior wall okay. MI and that no includes RV, but it's mainly inferior wall MI because inferior wall MI there is parasympathetic stimulation. 
and even primary bradyarrhythmias, you know, if you have a primary bradyarrhythmia, that will be bradycardia and hypotension. And sometimes mixed edema coma also, which is not so common, but once in a while you no, get... In the... huh? Mixed edema coma. Sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> this is the, uh, the, the, we are getting all this. Now, uh, now this patient has come to the ER and is uh, like this now, obviously, the GCS only four is hypotension. What emergency care should be given to a patient who's suspected to be uh, suffering from poisoning? Dr. Akshar? Pardon, sir? What is the emergency care you provide to this patient? Supposing you see this patient in the ER, this patient is apparently one of poisoning. What uh, emergency care should be given? So we start with the primary survey, uh, airway, breathing, circulation. So, so, so what will you do for him? For her? So rather? Most probably, most probably, most importantly, sir, I'll uh, intubate the patient. I'll start with the uh, intravenous cannulation and uh, crystalloids, sir. If required, uh, I'll start with the noradrenaline, sir. So you want to maintain the airway, you want in the blood pressure, you give fluids, you start noradrenaline. What else will you do? The so patient has to be in well ventilated area. I start with. Oh, no, that is all right. That is a that contamination. Is a big, but this is a case of poisoning. So what what will you yes. do for poisoning? So, uh, MLC. Simple washing. Simple washing would do. No, no, just yeah. So what do you like to do for poisoning here? Decontaminations. Decontamination, sir. Yeah, so what in decontamination, Akshar? Sir, I'll remove all the clothes. Uh, I'll uh, wash the skin with soap and detergent. If uh, the eyes are involved, I'll wash it with the normal saline, sir. And uh, if any element or anything other than uh, this involved, uh, I'll wash it with uh, uh, bleaching powder, sir. So what, what else? Okay, decontamination, what else? The patient presents within one hour of the ingestion, then gastric lavage can be considered because the airway is secured in this patient. Or activated charcoal. Yes, so Akshat, that is very important what Dr. Kushbu is saying, Dr. Akshat. You have to uh, do gastric lavage and give charcoal. It's, it's the most effective in the first one hour, but you can extend up to two, three hours. And okay. Yes. Okay, sir. So in which conditions is gastric lavage contraindicated? For which poisonings? Dr. Vishal? Sir, any petroleum containing. Okay, and what else? Any acid ingestion? Heavy heavy metal poisoning. Heavy, corrosive. Corrosive poisoning. No, only one person speak, right? When I take the name, only one person speak. Otherwise, audience cannot hear anything. So, Dr. Vishal, you have rightly said corrosive injury, uh, this thing. Uh, Acid, that is acid and alkali, corrosive alkali. and petroleum. Okay, so why you don't do gastric lavage in these two conditions? Uh, there is a chance of rupture of esophageal mucosa, damage to the gastric content, perforation of the stomach, due to injured stomach mucosas. Yes, okay. So that is uh, correct. So, perforation occurs in the case of uh, corrosive injury. Okay, that's why, because you don't want to put the rail tube. That is why you don't do the gastric lavage. And uh, why, why in petroleum you don't want to do petroleum poisonings? Aspiration can happen. Yeah, uh, because these patients are prone to aspiration and what you get is a, a very lipoid pneumonia, which can be very severe. Right, that is why you don't want to do in petroleum products uh, poisoning. These two poisonings kindly do not do gastric lavage. And uh, uh, this charcoal and gastric lavage, do they have a time limit? Like, can we do it? When has this patient come to us, Dr. Kushbu? Uh, this was, uh, the history is being, uh, of ingestion is, was around 9 a.m. in the morning. The patient arrived around 3 p.m. So the time was more than six to seven hours. 
So, Dr. Akshat, is it going to be helpful if you do a gastric lavage or give activated charcoal to this patient? No, sir. Uh, the efficacy of the gastric lavage decreases uh, after uh, one to two hours uh, by around 20 to 15 percent. And char charcoal, do you think we should give charcoal to poisoning patients? No, sir. You don't know. Do you know or do you don't know? Should we, is it recommended to give charcoal to poisoning patients? Sir, yeah, it is recommended if patient presents early only, sir. Okay. How early? So uh, within a span of one to two hours, sir. <coughs> okay. Uh, what are the other means of elimination, Dr. Akshat, of, uh, in poisoning? What other uh, methods can we employ? In the, maybe not in this poisoning, but uh, generally in poisonings. What are the other, other methods we use for elimination of poison? Dr. Vishal? Uh, gastric decontamination, sir. So, that, the, how do you do that? Uh, we can give sort of enemas. Okay, what else? Dr. Pushbu? Binding agents at times. Dr. Pushbu, what else can you do? Some sort of saline diuresis, some... Uh, Sir, on presentation or otherwise, otherwise dialysis in, could in, be in, Yeah, in general in the ER or you know, once the patient comes to you in the ICU. So this, uh, for a, generally in poisonings, what are the other methods we employ to enhance the elimination of the poison? Diuresis and dialysis. Yes, so dialysis, extracorporeal removal and uh, diuresis, alkaline diuresis. Huh? You do alkaline diuresis, especially for barbiturate and salicylate poisonings. And extracorporeal removal is especially useful for uh, certain CNS uh, drugs and the other drugs also. So if you get a poisoning, then always try to look up because nobody can remember all this. Unless one is a toxicology expert, you can always look up whether dialysis will help or not. So dialysis helps in many a poison. And then there is multiple dose charcoal, multiple dose charcoal. Normally we just give single dose charcoal but there are poisons which are eliminated. You know, we get uh, benefits if we do multiple dose charcoal. So these are some of the other uh, methods employed. Uh, you know, gastric lavage, whole entire uh, entire gut decontamination, etc., is not practiced anymore unless the patient has consumed a lot of like packets of poison or something like that. That is more theoretical. Okay. Now uh, about uh, the uh, I think the, we shall move on now. I think let's go to the next slide. So her initial workup showed. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. The ABG with the pH of seven point two three, with SpO two seventy two percent on O two support, bicarb eighteen, PCO two of sixty three, and lactates of six. Her CBC serum creatinine LFTs and CXR was ordered. Her plasma choline spirit sample was sent, considering OPP as a uh, poisoning. Patient was intubated for airway protection and desaturation uh, and uh, started on mechanical ventilation and Riles tube was secured. The decontamination started. She was resuscitated with one liter of normal saline and simultaneously started with noradrenaline to maintain a map of 65. Police catheterization was done and invasive monitoring were instituted. So just go to the previous slide, Dr. Krishna. You have mentioned intermittent fasciculations, which we had missed. And uh, intermittent fasciculations uh, generally occur in which poisonings, uh, Dr. Kushbu? Uh, so it could be with the, uh, as OPP is one of the cause, carbamates, then uh, pyridostigmines or uh, overdose pyridostigmine or uh, these drugs overdoses. So poisonings with cholinergic excess, right? Right, sir. Okay, that's good. So apart from that, also sometimes in neurological conditions, you can get fasciculations. 
and for that you have to take a history whether the patient had previous fasciculations like motor neuron disease, myasthenia brevis. They can also have some degree of fasciculations, and there are there is even bodilism uh, tox poisoning which can cause fasciculations, which is mm -hmm. acute uh, presentation. So fasciculations have a diagnostic value. And most commonly in the ICU, if you get fasciculations acutely, that is the patient does not have any chronic neurology disorder, there is 95% of the time it's going to be organophosphate poisoning. So what are fasciculations actually? Dr. Krishnu, you want to tell? This is a single muscle fiber twitchings. Uh, okay. Isolated. Okay, okay. So they are twitching, muscle twitchings, fine muscle twitchings are fasciculations. And uh, fasciculations, uh, if you see in the ICU, like I said, in the, uh, along with constricted pupils and hypersalivation are almost diagnostic of uh, organophosphate poisoning. There is no real other differential apart from the fact that other conditions with cholinergic excess can also cause this, but they are not so common. All right. Uh, one has to really think of organophosphate in this uh, condition. The clinical picture itself is very much consistent with organophosphate. Uh, okay, Dr. Just, just one thing that we need to remember that this particular symptom of fasciculation comes because of nicotinic stimulation. It goes through both cholinergic and nicotinic stimulations, and coincidentally, the cholinergic manifestations in organophosphorus poisoning manifest much later than the nicotinic manifestations. And it is the nicotinic manifestations which are much more prominent clinically and they come up. So, these fasciculations form part of nicotinic uh, milieu. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, fasciculations are because of the nicotinic um, receptors at the muscle, because the excess, excessive stimulation of the nicotinic receptors at the muscle, because it is muscle twitching. So, that is absolutely correct. Now, uh, one thing uh, we did not discuss was uh, the medical legal aspect. So, Dr. Vishal, what is important in terms of medical legal aspects here? When a patient uh, comes to you, sir, the first thing is we have to identify whether it is a homicidal or a suicidal case. That is all right, but what about samples, sir? Uh, we should take uh, the contaminated cloths, the gastric lava samples, the urine and a blood for the analysis. Yeah, yeah. So the samples have to be kept for uh, medical legal purposes also. That is very important. If you are doing any sampling, that has to be preserved for medical legal purposes. Huh? Gastric lava sample, blood sample, that, that has to be kept for the uh, medical legal purposes, especially gastric lava. Okay. So, uh, let us move on, Dr. Krishbu. This slide is done. Uh, should I move uh, further? Plasma cholinesterase sample was sent. Uh, so, uh, you want to tell Dr. Akshat uh, whether we should send plasma cholinesterase or RBC cholinesterase in uh, cases of suspected organophosphate? Uh, sir, RBC uh, acetyl cholinesterase carries much more value. Uh, it uh, uh, it shows uh, we can classify uh, it's a mild poisoning, moderate or severe poisoning on the levels of RBC cholinesterase. Which we cannot do on pseudopolinesterase level, sir. So, is plasma are extract cholinesterase better or RBC extract cholinesterase? Pardon, sir. Which extract cholinesterase sample is better, plasma or RBC? Sir, RBC cholinesterase sample is better, sir. So, what happens to the extract cholinesterase levels in OPP poisoning? So they are reduced. Uh... Why they get reduced? Hello? Why they get reduced? Can you help me, Dr. Akshat? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So why are the levels reduced? Why the levels are reduced, sir? Uh, uh, sir, OP uh, compounds uh, directly inhibit the acetyl cholinesterase levels, sir. Okay. And I will agree with that. Uh, now, let us move on. Then. So, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that. Whenever an organophosphate compound interacts with acetyl cholinesterase, 
it actually binds to it and that is how imaging happens uh, this why aging happens uh, aging of the enzyme is what matters and after aging the regeneration will take a long long time in terms of recovery okay. next slide uh, So the probable differential in this case are gastritis and food poisonings, myasthenia gravis, GBS, Giabari syndrome, botulism, mushroom toxicity, nicotine toxicity, organophosphorus poisoning, zinc phosphate poisoning, and carbamate poisoning. So, Dr. Vishnu, why are you considering gastritis and food poisoning here? And which Sir, after the patient has a history of ingestion and uh, the incidence. So there is a corroborative evidence that patient had something eaten and then the patient developed symptoms. So botulism. Yeah, okay. So you mean botulism, you have to be specific because if you want to say food poisoning, you have to say botulism here. All right. And <laughs> apart from that, uh, so other uh, GBS also would be out because GBS does not have fasciculations. DPS does not have fasciculations and hypersalivation is very important. Constricted pupils are very important, which is not a feature of uh, GBS or mycelia gravis or botulism. And mushroom toxicity, I agree. Nicotine toxicity also probably organophosphate, carbamate. But zinc phosphate, again, is not a differential here. I don't think zinc phosphate can be included. Zinc phosphate behaves somewhat like aluminum phosphate. So I don't think uh, that can be considered. But other things, like any any differential which has excessive cholinergic activity would come in the differential, and that includes your uh, mushroom toxicity, your uh, nicotine toxicity, and uh, your carbamates, and uh, of course organophosphate. But other toxicities are very rare. It's many organophosphate we see, and sometimes we see carbamate. So carbamate is always there when you have organophosphate, and unless you see the poison itself. You ask the patient to bring, you can never be sure, or you wait for the time course to elapse, you know, what time course uh, is occurring because government reverts in 48 hours. So that is about the differential diagnosis. So clinically, you know, once you get constricted pupils, hypersalivation, fasciculations, uh, the diagnosis is organophosphate. And one has to make a clinical diagnosis and treatment has to be started because, uh, you know, sometimes they bring the, the bottle, the poison, they show it to you, sometimes they don't, and sometimes it's homicidal also. So treatment often has to be started on a clinical uh, ground. That is uh, the approach and diagnosis of organophosphate. And it is highly treatable unless the patient has consumed a lot of uh, poison and all kinds of laboratory abnormalities can occur in organophosphate. So Dr. Krishnu, what happens to the lab values here? What kind of lab values did you get? Uh, in this patient per se? Yeah, in this patient. OPP poisoning. Uh, Lab value is normal by large or there was something? So in this patient, they were more or less same, but uh, that could be... To continue to that, I will just add one bit of more information that what can happen is usually most of the manifestations that we see are described as going to be happening within six hours of ingestion of poison. This is based out of a single trial wherein they actually gave chlorpyrifos to a patient. But the, pro but the problem was that whenever you give organophosphorus compounds, they do not come in pure form. The trial was given to a patient in a pure form, that was chlorpyrifos. And what really happens is how much content they have taken, how much quantity they have taken, this becomes very variable and you add the solvents, diluents, all those things. So the entire absorption scale and at what point in time they're going to manifest it, it becomes very dice. There is no hard guideline for that. Yeah. So as far as investigations go, you know, it depends on the amount of poison, the type of poison. Practically all abnormalities can occur. You know, I've seen a patient who has consumed excessive amounts and CPK was 70,000, sodium was 165, and then was, there was a severe derangement in lab values. But earliest changes are hyperglycemia, an increase in CPK, and an increase in TLC. An increase in TLC is actually a part of many poisonings is because of the stress reaction. So when you get a TLC high, 
do not think it's a, there's an infection. Uh, poisonings are known to cause a high TLC. So, <coughs> Dr. Akshat, what is the difference between carbamate and organophosphate poisoning? Uh, OP uh, reversibly, reversibly binds to the acetylcholine esterase, uh, whereas uh, uh, the carbamate binds reversibly. That is reversible. All right, and manifestations of carbamate generally go away in forty-eight to seventy-two hours. Okay, the manifestations are for a short duration. Huh? Okay, Dr. Kishu, move, let's move on. No further history was forthcoming. Patient remained stable on ventilator. Patient had bronchorrhea, bradycardia, diaphoresis, and persistent meiosis with a non contributory imaging study. Plasma cholinesterase choly level came to be low by day two. A provisional diagnosis of OPV was made. And relatives were informed regard, uh, regarding the same, and they were able to retrieve the bottle, bottle of malathion. So, it was a malathion free poison. So, so, is it important to know what kind of whether uh, the patient has taken malathion or pentheon or something? What is the nature of organophosphate? Is it important, Dr. Krishnu? Uh, yes, sir. OPP and carbamates, they are generally used as a household pesticide and agriculture pesticide. So, as you all, already mentioned, that carbamate. Uh, reversally binds to the uh, acetylcholine esterases. So the toxicity improves within 48 hours. Anotherly, OPP, uh, there are some lipophilic compounds. So if the compounds like malathion, uh, if they are lipophilic, then the symptoms may be delayed on onset. They may occur up to the uh, up to the five age after five days after the uh, history of ingestion and the symptoms may uh, remain till 30 days post ingestion and also with the lipophilic agent it is more commonly seen the uh, OPIDN that is a long term toxicity after the late and as well as intermediate syndrome is more commonly seen with the lipophilic as there is initial fat absorption of these lipophilic agents which gradually redistributes and then the symptoms starts increasing again after a period of emission. Yes, so that's good, Dr. Kushbu. So it is important to know what kind of organophosphate the patient has taken because they differ in their properties. Some of them need activation. Some of them are lipophilic and are very long acting. Some of them bind irreversibly and they are difficult to regenerate. So all this is very important because this gives the prognosis and it tells you what you are going to be dealing with. And in some of them, you know, PAM is more effective. Some of them, PAM is not so effective. So it is very important to know the nature of organophosphate. And uh, as far as plasma cholinesterase levels are concerned, there is a problem with plasma cholinesterase. So RBC is always better, RBC cholinesterase, but that's not so easily available. Cholinesterase levels are not so easily available. And the other thing is there's no real standardization and it varies from lab to lab. So you look at the lab values, and they should be on the lower limit or below the lower limit because uh, even the normal levels of cholesterol in a human being vary. So you have to, the cholesterol levels that you send should be at the lower level of that lab's reference range or below the lower level. That is the subnormal. That is how you interpret cholesterol levels. So uh, here, you know, uh, did you start the treatment at the beginning itself, Dr. Kushbu? Let us move on. Can you yes, sir. So, uh, should we skip this slide or we could... No, no, please tell, tell us. Tell us. Okay. So, the, this is a specific of cholinergic, cholinergic toxidrome as can be seen with OPP, opioids or anticholinesterases, uh, drugs like pyridostigmine and uh, neostigmines. So, the patient has... Uh, uh, seen, this is only cholinergic symptom, uh, symptoms covered in this slide, which includes pinpoint pupils, then there are over secretions everywhere. There could be sweating, diaphoresis, lacrimation, running nose. In lungs, there will be bronchorrhea. There will be uh, urge urination, increased urination, and the symptoms of diarrhea. Cardiac-wise, the patient may have bradycardia. So these are only cholinergic part of the OPV poisoning. There are, along with this, there are nicotinic symptoms also and CNS symptoms also. So, important to realize is around 10% of the patients don't have pinpoint pupils. Pupils can never be enlarged. 
but normal people size does not uh, preclude the diagnosis of organophosphate that is very very important because so, you know the pinpoint people are thought to be diagnostic of organophosphate for 10% of the patients do not have pinpoint pupils they have normal size pupils and that is because there is some degree of uh, you know sympathetic stimulation also or there will be some hypoxia or some other metabolic derangements which contribute to uh, the people being normal size at times okay so uh, why do you get cholinergic uh, symptoms dr akshat why is there cholinergic symptoms so because uh... OP compounds directly inhibits the acetylcholine esterase enzyme, which is responsible for the hydrolysis of acetylcholine. Uh, once the acetylcholine esterase enzyme is not functional, there is too much of the acetylcholine uh, acting on the muscarinic and nicotinic receptor and thereby causing the cholinergic manifestations. Sir. Okay. So where are the, where are the nicotinic receptors from? Production? Yes, sir. Where are the Am I audible, sir? So, nicotinic uh, receptors are found at nerve terminals. No, where, where specifically? Nerve terminals, obviously, they are at nerve terminals, but there's a difference between the location of muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors are preferentially found in the muscles and at uh, the ganglion in the autonomic nervous system and in the brain. And it is important because atropine does not act on the nicotinic receptors. Huh? Atropine, yes. which is an antidote, acts at the muscarinic receptors. Okay. So let us move on, Dr. Krishnu. So typical symptom chronology would be onset and duration of acetylcholine esterase inhibition varies depending on the rate of ACHE inhibition, route of absorption, enzymatic conversion, to active metabolites and lipophilicity of agent. This we had already uh, spoke about. Oral and respiratory exposures result in signs and symptoms within three hours, while symptoms of toxicity from dermal absorption may be delayed up to 12 hours. And lipophilic agents like dichlorphenithione, phenthione, malathion are associated with delayed onset of symptoms uh, up to five days and prolonged illness more than 30 days, which is related to rapid adipose, adipose fat uptake and delayed redistribution, redistribution from the fat stores. So another symptoms associated with this, like uh, there are mnemonics which we can remember, dumbbells and sludge. Uh, should we continue with this, sir? Uh, please carry on. Yes. So the muscarinic symptoms, that is cholinergic symptoms with uh, muscarinic, uh, which includes dumbbells, D for diarrhea, U for urination, M for meiosis, B for bradycardia, B for bronchorrhea, E for emesis, L for lacrimation, and S for salivation. So there is increased secretion from all the sites, plus there is meiosis and bradycardia. And the sludge, uh, which includes uh, mnemonic sludge, includes salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal dis disturbances, and emesis. Then comes nicotinic symptoms, where the patient may have muscular weakness, varying degree of paralysis, fasciculations. Patient may have hypertension and tachycardia due to nicotinic receptor stimulation, and occasionally midriasis may be present at the presentation. Patient will have pallor and paralysis. Central nervous, central nervous symptoms include restlessness, anxiety, headache, tremor. There could be drowsiness, confusion. The altered maintenance may differ into uh, maybe a small stupor or drowsiness may, uh, may extend up to the coma. There could be slurred speech, ataxia, patient may present with convulsions, patient may have respiratory failure, which may apnea and respiratory failure, which may lead to death due to hypoxia. Cardiovascular effects include ventricular arrhythmia with the prolongation of QT interval. Other symptoms include abdominal cramps, bronchoconstriction, wheeze, dyspnea, cough, pulmonary edema, diaphoresis, and hypotension. So it is very important to realize that predominantly uh, OP po poisoning manifests as bradycardia and hypotension, but sometimes because of nicotinic stimulation, it can have hypertension and tachycardia also. Around 10% of the patients presents with hypertension and tachycardia. 
and uh, though they have written my dresses in this, you know, my dresses is classically not seen. What you can get is a normal size people. So my dresses is not uh, generally see pedialed pupils you don't get. But yes, hypertension tachycardia is, uh, you get. I've seen also 10% of the patients come with hypertension and tachycardia. And you know, atropine is the antidote. So it becomes difficult to use atropine if there is tachycardia because that itself can cause elevation of heart rate. So we shall discuss that uh, in the treatment part. And I think uh, these uh, symptoms of OP poisoning should be known to everybody. This is very important. And, all, and even the respiratory complications are pretty common, which uh, she has shown here. Bronchoconstriction, wheeze, dyspnea, pulmonary edema. So all these uh, things happen in OP poisoning. And OP poisoning is one of the commonest poisonings in Southeast Asia and is a leading cause of death and morbidity in Southeast Asia. And, you know, there's even chronic expo exposure to OP poisoning. Some patients even have chronic exposure and chronic neurological symptoms, not only acute manifestations. Okay, Dr. Pushbu. Well, I'll just add to that. Whenever you see a clinical picture, who would actually be able to assess the severity there is something called as POP scale, which is used for organophosphorus poisoning, and it is uh, it was found by India only. So POP basically stands for Pardenia. So it's basically Pardenia organophosphorus poisoning scale, and it actually tests five variables, which define the severity and the likelihood of worsening of a organophosphorus patient. So that is something you can look up, you know, POP scale, because uh, it can be an exam question because it's been evolved from uh, this country only. Shall we move on, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Now, as we are talking about OPP, we can also consider uh, discussing about other toxidromes. Uh, so, anticholinergic, we had already spoken, which includes uh, high. Sorry, we were talking about cholinergic, and uh, then comes anticholinergic includes bradycardia, tachycard. Just a second, sir. Okay. So, we'll start with anticholinergic like uh, atropine overdose. So in this, we'll get what we see in totally opposite what we see in cholinergic crisis. In anticholinergic, there will be hyperthermia, tachycardia, hypertension, tachypnea. The patient must may be agitated and hallucinating. Pupils may show, show midriasis, which may make patient blind. Dry, flush skin. There could be urinary retention. Uh, and it is seen with the drugs like antihistaminics, Tricyclic antidepressants, atropine, scopolamine, and antispasmodics. Cholinergic, we've discussed about it, but this is seen in along with organophosphate phosphate pesticide, nerve agent, and physostigmine, which is commonly used as drugs. So, you know, Kushma, what MD. is a nerve agent? This becomes uh, this is an interesting thing. What are the nerve agents that you would associate with uh, cholinergic symptoms of uh, organophosphate? So, uh, documented are taboon, sarin are some of them. And uh, recently uh, in Europe, there was an uh, agent, I don't remember the name, but that has been studied in... Skripal. Uh, Skripal. Skripal was the one who was assassinated by the Russian government using uh, a nerve agent, namely uh, this thing. Uh, for for Vx and sarin, these are the ones that have been used. And in uh, Shinto sect of uh, Japan, there had been some mass suicides based on these... Mm -hmm. uh, mass uh, uh, inhalation of these patients with serine. Okay. Moving to hallucinogens, the PCP, L LSG, they are also present with the symptoms like hyperthermia, tachycardia, hypertension. The patient is hallucinating. There is associated midriasis and uh, nystagmus. Then opioid, opioid uh, also has symptoms like cholinergic uh, crisis where there is a hypothermia, bradycardia, hypotension, bradypnea, CNS depression and coma. Then there is hyporeflexia and pulmonary edema and the pupils will show meiosis, which includes all the drugs like heroin, morphine, methadone. Sedative hypnotics like benzodiazepine, barbiturate, alcohol, like present like hypothermia, bradycardia, hypotension, and bradypnea. They will also have CNS depressive features like confusion coma, hyporeflexia, and pupils will show meiosis. Then comes serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome uh, is associated with 
डिजिटिटी Drugs like cocaine, amphetamine, pseudoephedrine present as sympathomimetic features, which includes hyperthermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, agitated, hyperalertness, paranoid symptoms, midriasis, diaphoresis, tremors, and hyperreflexia and seizures. So collectively, cholinergic symptoms and uh, may resemble with the patient with the toxicity with OPP, nerve agent, physosequin, opioids, and sedative hypnotics, whereas sympathomimetics. Hallucinogen and anticholinergic present symptoms like sympathetic overactivity, hyperthermia, hypertension, and tachycardia. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. So, what more can have been done? Uh, this we already uh, spoke, sir. Like significant variation in toxicity for the individual agent, like. in uh, different agent uh, may present uh, symptoms of varying degree some may be very extreme or some may be mild symptom depending on the quantity as well as the agent inject ingested so this uh, trial of 1 mg of atropine to differentiate with carbamate poisoning is said but i don't think it makes much difference because most of the symptoms are more or less same with in carbamate as well as opp poisoning so initial treatment plans include atropine balm and if the patient is very agitated then sed sedation sos paralysis if there is a ventilator desynchronization decontamination we had already spoke about and if the patient present with seizure anticonvulsant in the form of benzodiazepines so i want to know so what are the anticonvulsant which you would like to use so preferably benzodiazepines because So you were saying something about the anticonvulsants, Doctor Nicholas. You want to tell something? Yes, sir. You were saying something about the anticonvulsants. You want to say anything? No, no, that is all, sir. Basically, benzodiazepines remain the drug of choice for these patients. Yes, sir. So I think uh, any particular reason for that? I haven't gone into that. No, I think you know this has been carrying on from a long time, but there is no harm in giving levetiracetam because levetiracetam is good and it acts fast. And as far as uh, the choice of benzodiazepines, the midazolam is also good. So you want to give midazolam because you know if you use phenytoin or something, sometimes they interact at the heart level. You know, phenytoin can cause bradycardia, blocks, hypotension, etc. And sometimes you do not know what kind of poison you are dealing with. So to play it safe. you know diazepam was recommended in the older literature but uh, midazolam is something which we give now but levetiracetam is also good i think now you can give levetiracetam also because it is a neutral drug it does not have any toxicity so that is what i feel even today the books mention mainly benzodiazepines but there are no real trials on this or anything it is just going on and the reason i believe is because you want to play it safe If you give phenytoin mm -hmm. or one of these levalproate etc they can be hypertoxicity they can be cardiac toxicity etc Sir, I don't know the specific reason, but uh, up to date had mentioned phenytoin is not recommended. So phenytoin is for this only. Phenytoin is only because it can have cardiac toxicity. It can lead to bradycardia. It can lead to hypotension, right? And when you get poisoning, you are not sure of what kind of poisoning you are dealing with. And so, and a lot of poisons have uh, cardiac toxicity. Similarly, if you want to give valproate or something, valproate can have, have can have hepatic toxicity. And benzodiazepines is safe, right? They don't have any toxicity in these uh, organs. Similarly, levetiracetam can also be given now because that also is neutral; does not have toxicity. That is that is what I feel. This should be updated. You know, this is going on for a long time. That benzodiazepines are drug of choice. I think levetiracetam is as good. And now we know in the ICU we are for if there is a single seizure, we always give levetiracetam only. I haven't come across any such recommendation as such. But I do not know practically. I mean, levetiracetam use is dominant in most of the ICs. Yeah, that that is what what I'm trying to say. 
but then again if you look at uh, if you look at the literature uh, for uh, you know for status for a single seizure if the patient comes the recommendation does not start with levetiracetam time the, the, it starts with uh, midazolam actually you don't give levetiracetam time right in the beginning it's the, after that you give levetiracetam time so still we go with midazolam because I, the, there is no difference in conversion rate as far as seizures are concerned the conversion rate to normalcy is the same for all anti-epileptics. It's probably the safety factor that we are concerned with. Okay, I think Dr. Krishu, move on. So going further in the case, by day three, patient's hemodynamics improved. However, she developed severe neck and proxical muscle weakness. Her GCS was 9, um, 10 by T. Her DTR were diminished. The nerve conduction showed postsynaptic abnormalities. Intermediate syndrome was suspected. Uh, the risk factor for this intermediate symptom include the exposure to the highly fat soluble organophosphorus agent, as in this case, and may be related to inadequate doses of oxymes. No, so one sec, Dr. Kushbu, if the patient has come to you now, we have reached day three. Did you start treatment at the outset or not? Yes, sir. We started her on atropine. When was atropine? Okay. Sir, in the ER, only the first dose of uh, atropine was given, suspecting OPP. It was very uh, likely to have a, a toxicity and symptomatic bradycardia mandated us to use atropine. So how much did you, after giving initial dose of atropine, was it escalated? Did you give infusion? Please tell. How did you? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. For this, I would like to move on the next side. The atropine dosing specifically in per se. So we administrator we have 0.6 mg per y, uh, per ampule available atropine. So we give 5 to 6 ampule as an initial dose. And we saw for the tachycardia and other uh, responses like uh, uh, reduction in the bronchorrhea and breathing. And if there is no do uh, no effect is noted, then uh, an infusion was started at the rate of 3 mg per hour. And it maintained till the target point was achieved. So, what do you think would you use as cutoff for atropinization? So, there is no such uh, absolute cutoff value uh, is given as it already been mentioned that up to 1500 mg per day has been given. The, our main target uh, to give atropine is to reduce in the reduction in the cholinergic symptoms. And uh, the things we look for is reduction in the bronchorrhea and improvement in the symptoms. Tachycardia and so, midriasis, which so that's what earlier was... At the bedside, is there any quick way to decide that this is probably how my dose of atropine is working? So about working is that there is an uh, observed tachycardia and pupillary dilatation, but so that what, cannot what, be considered as the end yeah, target. Yeah. So, so that that's what I'm coming to. Like mm -hmm. what has been happened is uh, that different scales have been recommended. This is with reference to heart rate and systolic blood pressure. What, what is recommended is, at times, is that just keep your pupils mid-dilated, target a heart rate, not more than 100, and look for decreasing or a very minimal secretions uh, on clinical examinations. So that is what is put as a rough guide when we give atropine for all of these patients. And we can repeat this dose if required of atropine. So I, I think Dr. Khushbu has put this very nicely here. So she has written administer starting 2 to 5 milligram IV for adults. And if no effect is noted, you have to stand at the bedside actually when the patient comes initially. The dose should be doubled every 3 to 5 minutes until heart rate of 80 and SVP of greater than 80 is achieved. So those are the general guidelines. But Dr. What, apart from what Dr. Niklesh has said, and once you achieve this, infusion has to be started at 20% of total cumulative dose. So those are the, you know, uh, the very specific recommendations apart from whatever Sir has said. So uh, that is a general guideline, I think, for everybody. That is how you give atropine and you have to start, you have to stand at the bedside. And sometimes, you know, the patient's heart rate is even 35, 40. Therein, you have to give a lot of atropine right at the beginning. So it is very important to give atropine because bradycardia and hypotension respond only to atropine and they are life threatening right there. Secretions are not a, a life threatening situation and many a time you will be intubating the patient so the airway secretions are taken care of. What matters is the bradycardia and hypotension and for that you have to push in atropine and once you start the infusion then the end point is uh, drying of oral secretions as well as of the 
preco bronchial secretions and uh, the uh, the uh, normal normalization of the pupils is not taken as an endpoint because mm. there are a lot of confounding factors in normalization of the pupil size pupil size is not taken as an endpoint so those things are very important and like she has shown even up to 1500 mg of atropine per day have been used and once you reach the endpoint you have to stop the atropine and once you stop the atropine the patient may again get cholinergic symptoms and then you have to restart then you have to restart atropine. So one has to continuously monitor the patient, especially the heart rate, the uh, the blood pressure, and the cholinergic symptoms in terms of secretions mainly. And uh, Dr. Akshat, what are the symptoms or side effects of giving so much atropine? Uh, so patient can go uh, in uh, atropine toxicity, uh, which manifests as uh, patient gets delirious, uh, there is a high grade fever, sir. Uh, uh, there is urinary incontinence, absence of bowel sounds, sir. Okay, so he gets. So we have to monitor that. Delirious, he gets fever and it becomes uh, uh, the skin becomes very hot and red flushed. So, what do you do if you are giving atropine? Patient has not yet achieved the endpoint and the patient gets atropine toxicity. What is to be done here? We can uh, switch over to glycopyrrolate, sir. So that is one thing. So what is glycopyrrolate? What are the chemical properties? Uh, glycopyrrolate uh, does not cause blood brain barrier, being a quaternary ammonium compound, sir. Uh, it does not have uh, CNS side effects, sir. Even cardiac, even cardiac side effects may not be there in terms of tachycardia, the type of tachycardia that you. And the other thing is, it is not have, like Sir is saying, it does not cause tachycardia. Those are two important differentials. So, glycopyrrolate is different from atropine. It does not cross the CNS. So, it does not cause CNS toxicity and it does not cause tachycardia. So, where is glycopyrrolate used? One you have mentioned just now, if the patient develops atropine toxicity. But actually, if the atropine toxicity develops, then you have to stop atropine and you don't start glycopyrrolate as such. You wait for the some symptoms. 30 minutes. Right? And then you start at 20% lower, the atropine infusion. If if there is a serious problem, right, then you may start with glycopyrrolate. Supposing the patient is unstable or something, then you might like to give glycopyrrolate. Okay? So that is how you manage atropine toxicity. The other situation where you use glycopyrrolate is when the patient itself comes with tachycardia and hypertension in the beginning, which is 10% of the patients. Because if there's already tachycardia, you don't want to give atropine. There will be further worsening of tachycardia. The patient may go into atrial fibrillation or other kind of tachyarrhythmias. So their glycopyrrolate is again is the drug of choice. Okay. But glycopyrrolate does not counter the tachycardia and hypertension. That subsides with time only. There's nothing much you can do. You can give small dose of beta blockers. But uh, that is a very subjective thing that depends on the overall situation. Okay. That is how you manage with the uh, glycopyrrolate. What is the dosing of glycopyrrolate? Generally half of the uh, half, half dose of the atropine. Okay. Yes. Half the dose of atropine. Dosing of glycopyrrolate is half of what you want to give for atropine. All right. So glycopyrrolate is a very handy drug in these situations. Okay. Carry on, Dr. Kushbu. So we discussed this. And the, for the patient who do not even respond to high doses of atropine, even epinephrine can be considered. As we already spoke, uh, dose titration to the therapeutic endpoint of clearing of the respiratory secretion and cessation of bronchoconstriction. Next slide. Okay. No pralidoxine. Okay, to palm and other oxymes such as HI6 and obidoxine. These are cholinesterase reactiving agent which are effective in treating both muscarinic as well as nicotinic symptoms. This should not be administered without concurrent atropine to prevent worsening of the symptom due to transient oxyme induced acetylcholinesterase inhibition. What PAM actually does it, it binds to the H2H uh, H combination of the serine enzyme activate site and it re uh, removes the organophosphorus leaving the site, but it sh should have been given earlier in the course before the aging happens with the OPP, some of the OPP agent. 
and it should also not be given without concurrent administration of atropine as due to transient binding binding of uh, pram with the opp there could be uh, uh, aggravation of the symptoms there could be increased nicotinic symptoms resulting into worsening of the paralysis so it should always be given with atropine and uh, should be given early in the course of the illness for all the patient with evidence of cholinergic toxicity neuromuscular dysfunction and exposure to opp agents known to cause delayed neurotoxicity so the palm is also known to delay the neurotoxicity associated with opp no treatment have been shown to prevent the intermediate syndrome or organophosphorus agent induced delayed neuropathy early oxygen treatment may be of benefit there is no clear evidence or studies which will clear cut show uh, benefit of palm in delaying or uh, in uh, reducing the incidence of intermediate syndrome and opp uh, organophosphorus agent induced delayed neuropathy but there are evidences of delayed neurotoxicity with the use of pam in both opp as well as carbamate poisoning and uh, if the patient is having renal dysfunction the dose modification of pam is required the dosing of pam is it is should be given slow iv over 30 minute the initial dose in adult patient is 30 mg per kg loading it rapid administration may lead to cardiac arrest in kids the dose is 20 to 50 mg per kg loading and which should be followed by a slow infusion at the rate of 8 mg per kg which possibly improves the muscle weakness when the continuous infusion is given a better antidote effect is anticipated now continuous iv therapy should be adjusted based on the patient clinical response as there is no end uh, cut off that how much should be given or there is no blood value which uh, even the rb acetyl cholinesterase to guide the uh, continuation or discontinuation or doses of the pam so serial rbc acetyl choline stress dose done and cv and mg in all together collectively may use uh, may be used to dis for discontinuing pam there may be several uh, requirement of the pam for several days before discontinuing the therapy who recommend pam is to be given and there is no inconsistent and difficult uh, to interpret its effect because there are uh, various trials none of the trial has given consistent uh, result with the use of pam as the patients who come with the opp toxicity have different there is a uh, there is no specific cohort where uh, we can apply this trial and uh, patient may vary into the amount quantity as well as the nature of opp ingestion then the time from presentation from the ingestion to the presentation also varies the dose of poison is also undetermined many a times and dose of palm uh, effectively uh, helping in antidote uh, sim, uh, acting as antidote is also not sure still due to uh, though, though there is a uh, concrete uh, evidence uh, for use of palm who recommends palm is to be given in all the patient with opp so just one thing to add uh if you are thinking in terms of a patient who's developing an intermediate syndrome assuming that it has happened what would be the earliest group of muscles to get affected based on which maybe you can make a bedside deduction that probably this patient would go into an intermediate syndrome so these are generally neck flexors where yes. after initial response the patient uh, may have improvement in the gcs and and the patient may suddenly or gradually even start telling you neck holding is so how, but how would you test them the patient is unable to hold neck for a long time and also the, the proximal muscle the bed, so we may have to ask the patient to lift with his, his neck bed, lift his neck and lift his head if the patient is unable to lift the head then probably there is a weakness of neck flexors and uh, there is something called as delayed neuropathy also which is described anyway i think it's getting covered in the later slides so we can move forward on that like sir has said neck muscle weakness is one thing what other group of muscles get involved at, uh, early in uh, this thing intermediate syndrome the proximal muscle group sir uh, what else happens what are the clinical features so mm. cranial neuropathy is huh? cranial neuropathy is also cranial neuropathy yeah cranial nerve movements are also there so uh, dr akshat uh, when when do you get intermediate syndrome Uh, we can get sir uh, mostly uh, from day three to uh, day eighteen. 
so it can occur any time after the first 48 hours right it can occur yes, why does it occur so most uh, uh, common uh, theory is the redistribution of the op compounds uh, the op compounds which are more lipophilic uh, will uh, again uh, gets redistributed uh, enters the blood and uh, we get the intermediate syndrome sir yeah so cause is not clear it is probably because of inadequate use of atropine inadequate use of pam or you know again there is a release of uh, the, the organophosphates from lipophilic stores it is not known so uh, how do you treat it so continuing support mechanical support in the patient what are mm -hmm. any role of take up to 4 weeks in treating uh, intermediate syndrome so it is recommended that again if you have stopped pam and atropine you can give atropine and pam again and uh, the treatment can go on you know the resolution of intermediate syndrome can go up uh, for two uh, couple of weeks also it can take time to resolve so why is the intermediate syndrome important what is the most important thing about intermediate syndrome so because of social issue you may uh, see that the patient is improving and you are about to wean the patient and then again patient deteriorates due to muscle weakness and uh, ventilator uh, he further requires ventilator syndrome so it may be difficult initially to convince relatives that the patient has deteriorated further you no know, that is all right but relatives is all right dr gushbu like you said weaning is a problem if you don't mm -hmm. for intermediate syndrome may estimate the patient the patient can go into respiratory arrest okay sometimes you don't check for muscle weakness and all and the patient is evolving into intermediate syndrome and you you extubate him and uh, you shift him to the ward or even yeah. in the he can have a respiratory arrest because respiratory muscle weakness is a part of intermediate syndrome and this has happened in our icu also so you know this is that is very important what are the problems in weaning in these patients muscle weakness first of all sir due to central nervous system depression so there may be time to uh, neurologically uh, recover for patient to re uh, recover neurologically first second then the muscle weaknesses may be uh, there so uh, third thing the bronchorrhea increased secretions which may hamper which may require repeated to uh, to uh, tracheal toileting and which may even uh, interfere with the weaning So, yeah. Dr. Nikhil, you want to talk about weaning in these patients? Uh, see, uh, intermediate syndrome actually depending on the type of compound you have, and it's mainly mainly supposed to be the lipophilic compounds which are the culprit here. So, uh, that can take time. These patients may need to be subjected to tracheostomy, and they may spend a considerable time on ventilator. Sometimes it may extend up to three to four weeks as well. Now, having said that, the other thing that is the delayed neuropathy. sometimes can have more permanent sequelae in the form of focal neurological deficits parkinsons and all those things but that would happen somewhere later in the course of disease most of the times what we see is these patients deteriorating from day 3 day 4 onwards then going on ventilator and they remain difficult to wean for quite some time gradually they start regaining their uh, uh, movements their respiratory power and then they are gradually weaned but that is true that it may take them at least 3 to 4 weeks so the important message for everybody is please check for intermediate syndrome uh, when you are going to remove the ventilator uh, or at some point in time and it is uh, manifested by uh, neck muscle weakness proximal muscle weakness cranial neuropathy and respiratory muscle weakness and it can occur at any time after the first 48 hours so that is very very important especially before extubating and after extubating it can develop even after that so you need to constantly check because if we go into respiratory muscle failure you can have a respiratory arrest all right so <clears throat> the way you start uh, atropine we have discussed and for pam she has told you you give around you know average adult 2 g loading dose over half an hour and then around uh, 8 mg per kg that comes to uh, around 500 mg per hour infusion and the duration is at least 48 hours or you continue till Uh, the muscle weakness resolves 
and the other ways in uh, those patients who are staying for a long time is uh, to look at the RBC cholinesterase because the RBC cholinesterase levels correlate with the cholinesterase levels at the neuromuscular junction. So if the cholinesterase levels in the RBC is normal, you can stop PAM or you can look at the nerve conduction velocities. So nerve conduction velocities, if they are showing a decremental response, that means that there is a neuromuscular junction problem still persisting. So there you may like to continue PAM. And uh, these patients also develop critical illness, neuromyopathy, uh, that also is to be remembered. So that can mm -hmm. also lead to problem in weeding. Some of these patients of organophosphate remain on the ventilator for long times. And uh, one has to provide good nursing care and critical illness neuromyopathy is not so uncommon. Okay, Dr. Khushbu, let's move on. Glycopyrrolate, we had already spoken. Uh, uh, it does not cause CNS. So CNS symptoms, toxicity due to atropine can be avoided. And the dose equivalent is half the dose of atropine. Okay. So carbamate poisoning, there is no harm or benefit in using palm as well as glycopyrrolate. Then if the patient present with convulsion, benzodiazepine is still uh, said to be a drug of choice. Aggressive decontamination and removal of clothes cannot be uh, underestimated because uh, if they're not, uh, if there is a source of uh, OPP within the clothes or in skin, there can be a gradual absorption from skin surfaces also. Gastric lavage is only after intubation when airway is secured within an hour or two after OPP ingestion and which should be preceded by atropine and oxines. Activated charcoal should be given within one hour and the dose is around one gram per kg. Post emesis is absolute contraindication and uh, they doubt about using urinary alkalinization patient with OPP. Okay, so to just to add to that again, the two compounds that I talk about on which maximum, uh, you know, long-term work has been done, chlorpyrifos as well as dichlorovos. Both of these organophosphate compounds, for these two compounds, they have even tried out extracorporeal therapies. And there are a few papers which <clears throat> talk about some limited success with them, but no great validation. Yes, uh, I agree. There have been some recent papers. In fact, I have read only part in which they showed earlier resolution of uh, the poisoning and, you know, the patient was discharged earlier with the use of extracorporeal movement. But, uh, you know, there are, there are, I don't think there will be any large trials. Uh, this is just anecdotal reports, so one has to judge clinically. By and large, in my experience, I must have seen more than 50 patients of organophosphate poisoning. And I think all of them got discharged except one patient. And that patient had consumed so much that she came in coma, 3 by 15, never got up. CPK was 75,000, sodium was 165. I mean, it was all over the place. She had consumed just too much. She never got up and there was no improvement at all. But apart from that, to the best of my recollection, all the other patients have gone home. And I have given PAM to all the patients. I, I give PAM and I have not seen a problem with PAM. Patients have stayed on the ventilator for two, three months also because, because the respiratory, everything improves, right? But the respiratory muscle weakness does not improve. Some of the patients have isolated respiratory muscle weakness persisting despite the improvement of everything. So even after staying on the ventilator for two, three months, these patients uh, can be weaned off and they go home. But uh, good nursing care then becomes very important. So I think this is one of the very treatable poisonings. And uh, the other... I would, just add, I would just add one thing. What really happens is that the entire crux of giving PAM remains upon the fact that uh, we need to intervene before the aging of the enzyme has happened. Once yes. the aging reaction happens, then it becomes very unpredictable as to whether giving PAM will help us or not one. Or even if it will help us in how many days it's going to take, that becomes an another variable, which probably there are no clear-cut and straightforward answers to that. Actually, like uh, Dr. Koshbu showed, there's a lot of heterogeneity in all the trials. So one, and that is because the poisons themselves are so many and they have different properties. Like some of them cause early aging, some of them need activation, some of them are slow acting, some of them go and deposit in the fats. So there's a lot of variability on all this. But generally, you know, give PAM and give atropine, give early enough and that is uh, the best results. At least give PAM for a few days, if not for a long time. I think that, that should uh, be the message. 
So, Dr. Akshat, before we close, how does SPAM act? Uh, PAM binds to the anionic site of the acetylcholine stress enzyme. Uh, after binding, uh, the phosphate molecule, which was already bind, that is the OP compound phosphate molecule, it binds with that phosphate molecule, uh, it causes conformational change and thereby releases it, releases it from the acetylcholine stress enzyme. So, once the acetylcholine stress enzyme is released, what happens? Sir, uh, it is reactivated, sir. No, so how does that help? So you are liberating the acetylcholine esterase. So how does that help? Sir, uh, it is then available for hydrolysis of the acetylcholine enzyme, okay. uh, which was responsible for the cholinergic symptoms, sir. Okay, very good. So I think uh, that is about all. Are there any questions from anybody? Dr. Vishal, any questions? No, sir. <coughs> any, any questions, Dr. Akshar? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Dr. Khushbu, you have any questions? Uh, sir, just one thing that uh, if glycopyrrolate is considered superior to atropine, why it is not used in first place uh, and we go for atropine as a first DOC as a treatment for OPP? No, no, glycopyrrolate is, uh, does not have any manifestations of the heart. If there is bradycardia, you have to give atropine, right? That is why. Most of the time, you have bradycardia. So that is why atropine is used because atropine reverses the bradycardia. Uh, glycopyrrolate has only used if there is tachycardia because glycopyrrolate does not uh, cause any effect on the heart. That's why glycopyrrolate is not used. And most of the times, it is used as a switch therapy. See, even if you were to give palm, even a single dose, as some centers do, or even for continuous infusions as some other centers do, you need to actually pre-medicate with atropine anyway. So that is one thing that goes uh, as a dictum. Later on, of course, in the course, you can obviously switch over to glycopyrrolate uh, as and when the clinical option gives you a choice on that. Okay. And one more thing, sir. Uh, I've worked in uh, uh, vill uh, near village area for a long time and I've seen Neurotoxic snake bite at times may mimic OPP, they, though there may not be any uh, bronchorrhea or uh, meiosis. Okay, but yeah, uh, okay. neurotoxins can have cholinergic manifestations. I agree, they can have. Actually, the neurotoxins can have all kinds of manifestations because the neurotox the the venom in the snake bites has many toxins. It has all kinds of toxins. Actually, you are right. They can have a cholinergic excess. Hundred percent. So, Dr. Shah, shall we conclude? I think so, sir. I think so. Okay. So, that was uh, about organophosphate poisoning, which is a very common poisoning, at least in Southeast Asia. If you get it right, most of the patients uh, can go home. So, do take care. Give uh, adequate doses of uh, atropine. Give PAM. And uh, watch for intermediate syndrome. And uh, take care of the patient's uh, overall ICU care. And very important, sometimes they develop neuropsychiatric manifestations also. And sometimes they have delayed onset uh, polyneuropathy. Those are long-term manifestations. It is not that uh, this is all that there is. Sometimes there is neuropsychiatric manifestation also. And there is, uh, uh, you know, organophosphate-induced uh, polyneuropathy, which, are, which have long-term sequelae. So uh, those are some of the other things which can happen to these patients. So uh, guys, with that, uh, I think we shall conclude. See you uh, in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.